This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. I want to tell you about our newest sponsor, Team Top Cat Sales. Are you looking for team apparel for your high school, your club sports team, or corporation? Look no further than Top Cat Sales, located on the east side of Main Street in downtown Royal Oak, between 11 and 12 Mile. Through founder and former University of Michigan QB John Wangler's leadership, Top Cat Sales has developed a tradition of selling and distributing custom Adidas team apparel with the highest quality and best service. Get your organization, school, or club team all in with Adidas today by going to TopCatTeamSales.com. That's TopCatTeamSales.com. Also, follow Top Cat on Twitter at Team Top Cat. Hey, everybody. This is Freddie Cohen of ESPN Radio. When I'm not talking about breaking news or breaking news on ESPN Radio, I'm always a fan and listen to the Detroit Sports Podcast, and so should you. Thanks, everyone, for downloading another episode on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. I am the Doc, John Macaroon. Joining me for episode 136 on the Doc and Jock Podcast, my cousin, Adam the Jock Strozinski. What's up, cuz? What's the good word, man? This is the best time of year ever. Honestly, it's like Christmas time. It's like waking up when you're five years old, running downstairs, and you have that Hot Wheels racetrack that you've been asking for since, I don't know, july your parents finally got it for you it came with three race cars you're ready to set it up and you're ready to go and it's just the greatest christmas ever march madness is upon us brother what's fascinating is now that we're upon the tournament thursday friday saturday sunday you can binge watch college basketball on one hand i'm super excited watching the tournament seeing how far michigan state's gonna go and a little bit later on stay tuned on this podcast i'm gonna share with you a dream that i had last night Utterly hilarious, and it freaked me out a little bit, but it's going to be a funny story, and I'm going to share it later on. You and Martin Luther King, huh? (laughs) Both had a dream. (laughs) So it's going to be a fun, interesting story, and uh, shows you how much I'm uh, dialed into Michigan State. So on one hand, I'm excited. On the other hand, there is just the anguish and being so frustrated and pissed off with our Pistons and Red Wings, what we've seen the last couple days. I don't know if I've ever had that bipolar swing of being so excited for one thing and being so pissed off. On the other hand, I mean, I've never seen anything like it with what these Pistons and Red Wings, man. Two days in a row where you really crap the bet in an important situation. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's uh, we're going to touch on them a little bit later on. We're the last segment of the of this uh, podcast will be d- dedicated to the Wings and inside Jack Jams. We'll talk a little Pistons as well, but you're absolutely right. They have left nothing out there. They look atrocious. I did have a tweet that did get sent out, and then it got stalled out, and then all of a sudden it got sent back. I don't know. It was it was insane. It was it basically the last couple of days it seems like somebody had the runs and they just cleveland steamered all over my chest it's been an absolute debacle the way those two programs have been playing and the pistons i don't know what it is as well as the wings it's just neither one of them seem to want it right now and that's a big issue speaking of debacles it, it'll, it'll help us segue right into our first topic so we're all excited you know everyone gets excited after the big 10 tournament because then you know It's time to reveal the NCAA bracket. We're all waiting to see who's going to fit where. Does Michigan get in? You know, the teams that are on the bubble, what's going to happen with them? And CBS used to do a marvelous job. They had it right year in, year out. In our program, boom, 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 you give us the brackets, we go about our way. Some people will go on to ESPN to watch the extended coverage or CBS Sports Network if you want to really break down every bracket and the individual games and things like that. Sometimes I would, sometimes I wouldn't, but I always tuned in to CBS to see what was going to happen with the bracket. So this year they decide, okay, let's just uh, you know be super greedy, and we know that we're going to have people that want to watch this. Let's go to two hours, and let's decide that we're going to just reveal the bracket at the, at the slowest pace possible and reveal one region every 40 minutes or so. And I'm like, this is horrible. And I'm getting reviews. I'm like, okay, I don't want to be too critical. Going on Twitter, the reviews are horrid. Everyone is just like, this is stupid. It was atrocious. You're wasting our time. It was absolutely atrocious. Honestly, you had... You have NBA guys on there, right? I love Chuck. I love Charles Barkley. I think he's hilarious. All right? You're miscasting him. He is an NBA guy. Let him do NBA. Same thing with Kenny Smith. NBA guy. Let them do NBA things. 
You don't need to bring them on there. I mean, they're not watching half of these games. They have no idea what they're talking about. Why are you going to bring them on here and have the, have them as an a, an expert here? All right. I mean, you've got you've got Gottlieb. He knows what he's talking about. That guy is a basketball guy. You've got Seth Davis. He's a basketball guy. Use those guys. They're college basketball dudes. You are pulling NBA guys, and you want them to sit there and you want them to break down Middle Tennessee's basketball program. They're looking at you like, I don't even know. I didn't even know Middle Tennessee had a basketball team. Let's be honest. It's just uh, atrocious, man. Why? Honestly, I have no idea why. You're right. They had the formula. It was an hour long. You get in, you get out. You give people what they want. And if they want more, there's other stations, other other avenues to get it. Instead, this is where greed kind of takes over and like, hey, we're going to do a two-hour time block of all college basketball. Now, I understand the concept. You could have a two-hour show if you want to sell advertising. You know you're going to get viewers. But release the bracket in like 30 minutes. Boom, boom, boom. Get all the brackets out of the way. That's the part that people want. And I would say you could even have a three-hour show. People would stay on because you're talking about the bracket. We already know. You can have that debate back and forth. That's the exciting part of where's your team, that reveal. Where is it at? Oh, I remember in years past, I text you, oh, state got revealed, and, and and we'd be all excited. Then, all of a sudden, we're all just bitching on Twitter. Everyone's complaining. All of a sudden, the miracle happens about 45 minutes into that debacle. Someone leaked the bracket. I'm looking at it uh, because it was retweeted, so I didn't see the original post. Whoever I saw posted, someone, that's a savior. Honestly, unbelievable. Sa- savior. And I think uh, in talks, um, I think SI kind of said it was someone from a website called Page 2 Sports had the information somehow or another. So he puts it out there. And the first question is people are like suspicious and things like that because of, you know, we don't think that someone's going to actually release the bracket. But, you know, as the more retweets happen, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 retweets, I'm looking and I'm starting to see what's going on. I'm like, beautiful. Thank you. I retweeted it and I said, this is great. Boom. I instantly turned off CBS and said, forget it. I'm just going to peek in at this bracket. Where's Michigan State at? Who did Michigan get in? Okay. Who who got out? Oh, okay. You know, you had some mid-majors who got snubbed like usual. Nothing new there on that front. So all in all, a couple of seed, you know, a couple of seeds that you go, really? You know, Syracuse, a 10 seed when they shouldn't really be in at all. So a couple of things minor. Overall, I like the way the bracket's set up. I was satisfied, but the thoughts on the league was it was epic. It was awesome. And and really, I'm actually kind of surprised this hasn't happened more often. Yeah, John Doe from Page Two Sports. Hey, you you, awesome. you, you wear a crown, bro. You're At a hero. Richie on Twitter was his was his moniker. Was At it? capital R I C H I E. Soon after, like literally half hour after the buzz kind of started happening, there was a leak. Deleted his account. That account and uh, the account was kind of mean too. It was like uh, I'll look it up on the phone, but he had like a really kind of nasty name. But he just threw it out there and was just like, spoiler alert. Here's the bracket. Beautiful. He dude, he saved everybody a lot of time. Honestly, it was. That the show was atrocious, all right. So the leak of the bracket was was fine. I stayed tuned and I still watched a lot of it because I'm a very skeptical person. So the leak comes out. I look, I check it out. And I'm like, okay, cool. Michigan's in. I was surprised. Um, I was really upset about Michigan State, and we'll talk about that in a minute. I was really kind of annoyed initially when all the ones were released that Michigan State wasn't a one. I was outraged. I found out where Michigan State was. I was like, okay, this makes some sense. Everything's gonna be okay. But I still wanted, I, I needed that double confirmation. I needed to be sure. So I needed to see it on CBS. I needed them to release it because I needed I needed to make sure that what I was getting at, in the leak was actual factual. So I stay tuned. I kept it on. Probably could have found something better to do with my time. But hey, the guy who leaked it, thanks. I what, what ended up happening was I could just pay a lot less attention to what was going on. And I could tune in when I needed to know if Michigan was going to be in and if Michigan State was going to be in and where. Just real quickly, is there anything else that you would think people wait for besides the Oscars? Because the Oscars goes four hours. Sometimes it's so long. I'd love to have a leak with all the winners there. Is there anything else you can think of that if it was leaked would save us a lot of time? I mean, it's just so perfect because, you know, we had an opportunity to really enjoy something that everyone that loves college basketball enjoys. They ruined it. We get it. But it's kind of like the ultimate, you know, anti-establishment movement. Hey, we have this power now to kind of thwart CBS's efforts in terms of holding us hostage to watch the brackets. And hey, we got it. We got the information. And it was just, I was so, I thought it was the funniest thing I've ever seen because not only do you kind of screw up CBS and they're kind of going like, you know, still going out to the uh, remote sites for all the colleges telling the teams, hey, act, react, stay calm. We're going to go to you soon when everyone had already known. And then you had radio stations trying to figure out. Jason told me that it was kind of awkward for them and really challenging being on Detroit Sports 105.1, trying to break stuff down when 
everyone already kind of had that. So the intrigue, the storylines kind of all got shattered with the crap. For Michigan, it was a, a, a walk-on who found out through the leak. Walked in and was like, hey, guys, we made it. That's how they found out, which is a total letdown when <laughs> when you got the entire when you got the entire team lined up in an auditorium and you're waiting to find out. And one of your walk-ons comes walking in a half hour, 40 minutes beforehand. It's like, hey, guys, we're playing Tulsa in a playing game, just FYI. It just a total letdown, right? It, it, it's got to be. And I couldn't imagine what they were, what they had to go through on uh, on 105, one sitting there trying to break things down, trying to get in depth, and just kind of go through the minutia of it all. And it's already out there. It, just difficult, absolutely difficult. With the reveals, though, when the number ones were announced, how pissed off were you? You're a Michigan State fan, so take yourself back into time and, and just kind of in that vacuum before the leak even comes out, before you know where Michigan State's going to go. They announced the number ones, and Virginia is announced as a number one seed. Virginia didn't even win their win the ACC regular season, didn't win the ACC tournament, yet third number one seed. And Why? Michigan State is left out. First I, time that's ever happened. I was furious. Exactly. First time that's ever happened where a team that doesn't win any kind of awards or any kind of tournament or any kind of accolades gets to the number one seed. So I'm like, okay, what's the justification here? This is after a great performance by Michigan State in that Big Ten title game. Had you decided the number ones maybe midway through the first half, you see Michigan State battling. You see them playing strong. You see them coming back. They're not getting dominated by Purdue. I think at that point, if that's where you're starting to establish the number ones, Michigan State's ranked number two in the country. So how does that logistically work where you're ranked number two but not worthy of a number one seed on the committee? And another point that came out, ultra frustrating, is Michigan State's ADs on the committee. He is there in the meetings. How does he not raise a stink? How does he not, like, go, what the heck's going on? Come out, talk to us, tell us a little bit about how is Michigan State a number two seed? Now, so at that point, I'm looking like, really? This is really how we're going to get dissed? Then my anxiety goes way up when they reveal the South bracket. And I'm like, no, they're not going to put them with Kansas, number one, two, Michigan State. We can't have that. No, come on. So then I'm like, okay, here we go. They go number two, Villanova. Whoo, I, I, I let out a sigh of relief. I was like, okay, good. They're not number two in the South. I'm like, okay, likely they're going to put us in the Midwest where we belong. I don't think that, you know, I would have cared. I would. I don't think it would have been that important if they were number one in the West. That would have been kind of dumb. But I was happy that it came out that they were number two in the Midwest, and I saw number one, Virginia. I'm like, oh, we've seen that dance before. We've seen that rodeo. Michigan State can have like a half-assed uh, video session because they play Virginia almost every Every, every year. single year, it seems like. It's like you know what's going to happen. It's going to be a close game, and Michigan State and Valentine and Forbes hopefully will step up late, and it'll be a fun, grinded-out kind of game, and hopefully Michigan State takes it again because they've had Virginia's number. So I was satisfied because in the end, one, two in the Midwest, just the only difference is – color change so I mean if if Michigan State's gonna have to wear what white in the game instead of wearing their green jersey it's no big difference so you know Michigan State Virginia when I saw the bracket in the Midwest I'm like dang they gave us a pretty solid chance if we do if we handle our business to go to the final four so after uh, 20 minutes of being frustrated all all went away when Michigan State's bracket got revealed and where what their matchups are it's all good brother we got a good chance once I found out that they were going to be in the Midwest and they were a two seed in the Midwest and looking at what they had to go through to get to the championship round, I think this works out great for Michigan State. If I had to tell you that you get to play a Middle Tennessee team, you get to play the winner of Dayton Syracuse. And again, you said it at the very beginning, Syracuse probably doesn't even deserve to be in this matchup here. All right. And then you play probably you, you have the possibility to play probably the worst number three seed in Utah. And you can either probably play Gonzaga or Seton Hall. I think you're going to take that all day long. And your biggest your biggest roadblock is either going to be Purdue, who gave you a little bit of a run for your money both times you played them during the year in the championship game as well as in the regular season, or Virginia, who you said, we've, we've had this dance. We've done this rodeo. No problems. So if I was to tell you you'd have the possibility of playing all these teams to make it to the Final Four, you would sign up in a heartbeat. So you're right. Initially, when it was released, I was furious. I was screaming at the TV. I didn't understand. I was like, wow. This is just utter, complete and utter disrespect. Did you, did you guys have these already filled out on Saturday afternoon and just decided to plug them in? We're waiting here now for two hours to get this, and it was already done yesterday? This is BS. But then once you kind of look and you break it down a little bit, you look at where Michigan State has to go and play. You look at what they have to do to get to the Final Four. If Michigan State doesn't make it to the Final Four, this will be an epic collapse. Tom Izzo will have had done something wrong, and these players would have had to have tuned him out 
because this sets up perfectly for Michigan State. There was no reason Michigan State should not be playing in the Final Four, and when it comes down to it, they should be playing for the championship. And so, obviously, the majority of people who are filling out brackets are going to put Michigan State farther along. So I'm interested to see how far you actually have them. We'll talk about who we have in our Final Four and maybe championship matchups just a little bit later on in this very segment. I don't think in the tournament you can say that Michigan State, uh, the players would have tuned Tom Izzo out if they have an underperformance. you got to remember, now Michigan State's coming off of a tough Big Ten tournament playing Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Now they're going to, you know, and Justin Rose tweeted out that they had a great intense practice on Monday. So now they're going to rest up. They're going to play Friday, 245, Middle Tennessee State, St. Louis. They're going to be very comfortable. That's relatively close. We're going to have an opportunity to, you know, you know, not have to be too far away from the Breslin Center in East Lansing. So it sets up okay in a Friday, Sunday type situation. But in the tournament, and anytime you play a team, there's always that. That's why the tournament's so awesome. There's always maybe that one guy that shows up and is just lighting up the, the scoreboard. It just gets hot. There's one guy maybe that, you know, just is having the, the lights out tournament that he's always wanted or the lights out performance. So in the tournament, what makes it special is there are these unsung moments. There are these unsung heroes that just show up in these tough games. So each and every game is an opportunity for State to prove themselves. And I really believe that their talent and their ability to kind of do the things you need to do to win games, defense, Grind it out, hit the big shots, senior leadership, Costello and Valentine. The only concern I'm having is Bryn Forbes comes into this tournament having a you know difficulty and, and slumping in his shooting performances. That guy can be that guy that can open up a lot of things on that offense for Michigan State. And as a State fan, when you watch a lot of games, you start to see the, the similar performances. I'm like, seriously, one of the only games I got to tune in quietly was versus Purdue. What am I seeing? Turnovers. They're getting to the rim, and they're not finishing. Those are the type of things that can happen in a tournament game. That game they look, makes me nervous. Uh, that that game right there, they look like they came in maybe a little too hype. They look like they were really pressing, especially in the first five to seven minutes of that game, where it it was you go down, take a shot, misses. They get the rebound, come back down. They take a shot, miss. You get the ball, you go back down, you turn it over. They get the ball. It was like back and forth in no scoring going on whatsoever. They came in, I think, a little bit too hyped, a little too jacked, which I think bodes well for this team. If you are able to go into your Big Ten tournament championship game a little bit too high strung, a little bit too amped, a little bit too up, and you're able to come away still with the championship and you play as well as you did down the stretch, I think that bodes well for this team. I think it's a great learning experience. They now can put that behind them. They've gone through it. They've lived through it, and they were able to overcome it and they're going to be a better team for it on the other end. See, I wish it was just a little bit easier for Michigan State. You remember the the badass Kentucky teams of years How past? How much easier do you want this? No, no, here's what's got to happen, though. Denzel Valentine's got to hit his shots. Costello's got to be rebounding well. Yeah, they, but that goes with and, every and team. And they got to finish. They do, but when you had teams like Kentucky, you knew they were going to blow teams out early on. Michigan State has that ability sometimes to kind of stall out, have those uh, moments where their offense is yeah, just not in rhythm. Yeah, because Kentucky had like eight guys that were all number one NBA draft picks. And this is why Come I, on. This is why when you get to my story about my dream, it's, it's going to be hilarious because I get a little nervous when it's like, you know, only like 16, 13 with like 10 minutes left in the first half. It's, it's, it's nerve-wracking because you know some of these teams are going to get on runs. This is the tournament. People, you have to play game in, game out. And if you have remembered now, Michigan State doesn't have a, a, too much of a habit of blowing teams out, making it easy for us. I've, I've lived through way too many uh, Louisville games, way too many Virginia games, where it's like we're going down to the two minutes here, and it's like a two-point game where we have the lead. That's a little <laughs> heart-wrenching. That's how Michigan State plays. And so they've been the beneficiary of being able to, you know, advance with big shots now and now and again. So... But I do believe Va Valentine is ready to go. He's ready to put this team on his back. Yeah, I think he's the best player in, in college right now. Should this team do what they got to do and advance further, he's got to be the MVP and he's got to take his game to the next level. That's the part that is going to be fascinating to see is, okay, the majority of people kind of have it. Michigan State, North Carolina, big dance, Final Four. A lot of people are either going to put Michigan State advancing or they're going to have North Carolina advancing to the title game. And so that's the, going to be the, the matchup. Should they, you know, actually live up to the hype, get to the Final Four? I think it's, you know, the opponent most likely to be staring at them is going to be North Carolina. And in that game, Roy Williams, you know, North Carolina's had the edge before. Michigan State in the title game in 2009 started off very slow. And they were able to rebound the second half, actually outscored North Carolina. But in the end, you know, at Ford Field, North Carolina took down the title. And it was, it was devastating. It was super tough. 
you know, and it was, it was actually one of the first times, you know, I got to see a college basketball game at that level when State played UConn back, I think, in 2009 at Ford Field. It was awesome. A great experience. Uh, a totally different vibe. I just hope that as Michigan State advances, they do get better. They do show what they actually made of because a Michigan State team playing A-plus prime ball, I want to see it at the at the right moments. Too many times versus Duke, too many times in those final fours that Michigan State's made, we haven't exactly played our best, and and the same things you know would occur. So I'm hoping that they go far. I can let you know now. In all my brackets that I filled out, green baby, winning it all. I got State versus Kansas, State winning it all. And uh, in all my brackets, I'm going to roll the dice. Um, not saying that I have uh, 100% confidence in that, but this is the year to do it because each and every time they've made a number two seed, they've gotten to the final four, and they're, they're hell-bound and determined to advance and to get Tom Izzo that second title. This is as good as year as any. So Doc has State taking it all down, baby. Yes, sir. What are your thoughts on Michigan getting in? Did, did that surprise you at all? Were you shocked by this? Um, by my thoughts about it? Yeah. They're playing? They're, they're in the dance? They're playing. They're, they, they get the play-in game. How embarrassing. Against Tulsa. Well, they get in. Okay, that's good. I feel great for John Beeline's accountant. 25 Gs. He gets a bonus for just getting the play-in game. I'm like, that's pretty good. 25 Gs just to get into the play-in game. I think that's the best matchup that they could have gotten. The One of the only ones where they're going to be favored. So they should be in the dance, I think, in, in, in earner spot versus Notre Dame, I believe, in that first round. Mm-hmm. So I would be surprised if they lose to Tulsa with some preparation. They've played pretty good, you know, being mind Indiana. You, mind you, Tulsa has played SMU in one and yep. has played UConn in one. Those are both two schools that yeah. Michigan played and, and just got waxed. So, yeah, I, I'm not saying it's a cakewalk, mm-hmm. but I believe that, you know, Michigan's going to come out with their best performance and they got a chance. But I, I, my thoughts on Michigan making it, better than not making it, that's for sure. Yeah. Better than getting bounced out and going to. I hear now there's other tournaments, Vegas 16, NIT. I've never heard of that. I think Vegas 16 is brand new where Oakland got invited and things like that. But just, They just make things up. Vegas as, as 16, right? It's insane. I, I've turned that down. Just, yes. You know, just practice and do what you got to do. Right. But um, Michigan, I th- and I and I don't know why, but when you look at Cinderella teams, you look at teams that are able to shoot, get hot, and able to do some things. And maybe this is a team that's peaking at the right time, and maybe they'll find some level of uh, motivation to do what they got to do. But when I look at Cinderellas, Michigan's one of those teams that could do some damage in a game should they get hot, should they be, should they uh, start draining those shots. Logic will tell you they'll probably lose to Notre Dame, but I think they could be. You know, one of those teams that looks like Cinderella. You know what? I, like you said, it's better to get in than to not get in. I think it's a good thing for Michigan to be there. I think they match up very well against Tulsa. Again, Tulsa beat SMU, beat UConn. These are two teams that Michigan has struggled with. But I think the committee did a huge favor for Michigan. You're playing against probably the worst team in the entire tournament in Tulsa. There was a lot of talk that they shouldn't even be in there. Uh, a team like Monmouth, who should be in there, was overlooked for a team like Tulsa, who has a, a ton of bad losses. Michigan gets in. I think Michigan gets hot. I see them beating Tulsa. I see them going up against Notre Dame, and I see them beating Notre Dame. I see them winning at least two games in this tournament if you want to count the play-in game. Michigan and Notre Dame play the exact same way. They both like to shoot the, the, the three ball. Their backcourts tend to be the strengths of their team. They don't do a very good job defending down low. So if the shots aren't going in, you're not winning. I think Michigan gets hot. I see them getting on a little bit of a roll here, and I see them making a little bit of noise. So are you willing later today? I got to figure it out because I'm you know, new to this uh, app situation in terms of filling out brackets. I filled mm-hmm. it out online, imported all the brackets. So all my brackets are the same in our podcast host challenge, in our challenge with the listeners, in, our ch- in, in the challenge that you invited me, which I hope is free. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, good. No, $10. $10. $10. $10. Okay, okay you'll get it a dollar at a time for 10 oh, weeks. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I love how you're all, all, all the other ones. All the other ones are free, okay. but yeah. Okay, so uh, th- th- that one is ten dollars. Are you willing? I think on some level, I did see a share button. Are you willing to share your bracket with our Twitter followers? I did that already. Oh, you shared it. You shared it. Yeah. Where is it at? I didn't. I it look should at it. be on my on my Twitter feed. Oh, you shared it already. Early. Yeah. This is the one you filled out universally. This is the same one. Um, this is. I believe this is the one that I filled out for for our challenge with the listeners. Okay. And generally, they're all pretty much the same. 
there's a few differences. I there I, I changed yeah, probably the the fives and the twelves. Oh, you did. Yep. Yeah. It says I've got Michigan State. You, yeah. you didn't tag me in it, so that's why I didn't say. I'm it. sorry about that. I just, yeah. I just hit share. I'm when yep. it popped up. So yeah. Exactly. So I'm so, gonna do that later today. Yep. So okay, you've got Michigan State. I do. Good man. I Good do. man. All right. I, so, you know what? I, who do you got? Who are your other two? I know you said you have Kansas going up against Michigan State for the championship. Who are the other two that make it to your final four? Yep. My final four. Stay with me now. Here it is. Michigan State, mm-hmm. North Carolina, Kansas, Oklahoma. I, right. I don't think that um, the number one seed uh, in that region, uh, I think Oklahoma's number two seed in that region. They are. So I have them advancing, and then the rest I got the big names. I feel like just looking at the research, looking at all the experts, what they're thinking, and judging how uh, Oklahoma's played the latter half of the season, I like what they've been doing. They can be a team that can do some damage. And... I'm hoping that maybe if they get to a Final Four matchup versus Kansas, that, hey, maybe they, you know, make it a, a situation where they advance and it's Michigan State, Oklahoma, and Michigan State can win. But I have those teams in my Final Four to recap. Michigan State, North Carolina, Kansas, Oklahoma. That's my Final Four. I've got Oklahoma, who's the number two seed. i got Kansas. I've got Michigan State, and I've got Kentucky. Kentucky's pissed off right now. John Calipari, he's angry that he got a four seed. He thought he should have been higher. On top of all that, Buddy Hill, who plays for Oklahoma, is probably one of the best players in college basketball right now. He's the one who's challenging Denzel for player of the year. In the end, I think it becomes Kansas versus Michigan State, and I think Michigan State takes it. Yeah, I, I, I'm hoping so. So you're thinking that now in the marquee matchup versus Kentucky, that Michigan State can have the uh, have the ability to raise up their performance and really do what they got to do. Because in recent years, they haven't... Uh, been shown to do that, been known to do that. So I'm a little bit nervous about the Final Four matchups. I do have a feeling, though, that, you know, there's going to be a Cinderella team out there. A lot of people are picking the well-known programs, but there could be a team out there that just comes in and uh, does some damage that is, that's lower seed. Who would you say would be, if outside of the, the marquee names, have you looked at anybody that, that you could say maybe could be that VCU, could be that Butler that kind of, you know, sneaks their way into the party uninvited? Um, you know, a little bit difficult this year because there's so much parity with pretty much every team out there. So it makes it a little bit difficult because you kind of want to lean on the big names. You want to lean on the Kansases, the Michigan States, the Kentuckys, the guys who are there all the time. Uh, That being said, a team to watch out for, you should probably take a look at maybe Wichita State. I mean, they basically manhandled Vanderbilt on, on Tuesday evening. That was a game that I thought was going to possibly go the other way. I thought Bandy had a real good shot to, to beat Wichita State, and it was close going into halftime. Second half, Wichita State poured it on. That's a team who looks like they'll be very disruptive. Also, maybe uh, Northern Iowa or Ionia. Those two programs could sit there and cause headaches for people. Um, a lot of people are hot on Yale. Yale's got a real good shot here. If they can get by Baylor, who may, as, as Justin Rowe said, take them very lightly, they get into a matchup possibly against a Duke program that's not very good this year. They beat Duke. They're all automatically in to, what, the Sweet 16 now, and they're probably taking on an Oregon team who they might match up well against. Nope. So it, Yale, Yale's one of those teams that you should watch out for as well. Okay, you heard it here. Pay attention to Yale, maybe Wichita State. Now, you said on the WXYZ web show, you just got a thing for Shaka Smart. Still? I do. I love Shaka, man. Still this year? I, I don't know. I love Shaka. He's with I, Texas, I, right? With yeah, Texas? he's with Texas. I, I don't know if, if Texas is going to make a whole lot of noise. I see them getting by maybe Northern Iowa. Northern Iowa is going to be a tough out, but I think they have enough talent to get by them. And then I think they lose to Texas A&M. Okay, so A&M's um, got a real good team this year. Why do you think State's going to win it all? What gives you that sense that this is the year of um, magic for Michigan State? I'm just watching Denzel play, I am impressed with him every time I watch him touch a basketball. Honestly, he, he watching the Big Ten championship game, there was a point there where he was falling to the ground. He stumbled. He loses the ball, is able to get a fingertip on it, and flips it up for an alley-oop dunk. I mean... He, he's amazing. The kid can play every single position on the floor. He can handle the ball. He can post you up down low. He's got so many different facets to his game. Honestly, he reminds me of a little bit less talented Magic Johnson. Honestly, he is that good. He can play everywhere they need him to play. On top of it, he's a senior. That senior leadership says a lot about a player, the character of him, as well as him being able to sit there and get these guys to go where Tom Izzo wants them to go. He is the unquestioned, unbridled leader and voice of this team. I love Denzel. Honestly, I'm putting it all on Denzel. It hasn't been a great week 
outside of Michigan State's program for some former athletes, a la Brendan Dawson and Mateen Cleaves. But we'll put that distraction aside. Um, those things still got to be worked out in court, but some pretty serious violations for some ex-MSU athletes. It's unfortunate to hear that kind of stuff right before the tournament, but we'll put that aside. I do believe Tom Izzo will get this team motivated, and I do believe that this is a strong chance for them to really get back to the Final Four again and have a chance to rise up. I got Michigan State winning. I'm laying my hopes on that they're not going to disappoint their entire fan base. I'm super excited. I can't wait to see it. It's going to kick off. Man, what a great segment talking college basketball, talking Michigan State, another time of year where uh, Tom Izzo and the program can show off what they can do. And I really believe everything that you said, Denzel Valentine, Bryn Forbes, Costello, some unsung heroes on the Spartan teams, Davis, Tum Tum. Let's see what happens, man. I can't wait to see it. The other good thing about Michigan State's team, they've got guys who know their role and they have no problem fulfilling what they have to do on that court each and every time up and down it. I think Michigan State's the most complete team out there. Yes, sir. Let's take a quick time out. We'll get to my dream, and we're going to play a round of Jock Jams, and we're going to talk about the Red Wings and another mock draft from the NFL.com in the second half of this podcast. Stay with us. Doc and Jock, Detroit Sports Podcast Network, episode 136. Doc and Jock here for Fanatic U. If you're looking for some sweet sports swag and you love your Detroit teams, and I mean you really love your Detroit teams, you got to check out FanaticU.com. And get the coolest gear out there and rock your Red Wing shirt, rock your Lion shirt, rock your Piston apparel. Wear it till the wheels fall off. Michigan, Michigan State, you know what? They got it too. Check out Fanatic U. They have six locations all over Metro Detroit. Check them out. FanaticU.com. Yeah, we coming now. All right, sir, we're moving right along here on our weekly episodic Detroit sports podcast going strong since September 2013. All right, real quickly. Episode get... 136, bro. What? I, yeah, 136. Going so we're on, strong. Yeah, we're on 136, right? Yes, sir. I got, I got that right this time. <laughs> That's good. I know, it, I know it changes every week. I'm always messing it up. So You're like, dang, this guy even critiques me on my <laughs> freaking rundown? <laughs> At this point in time, I'm hoping, I'm literally surprised. Two and a half years, I haven't missed up a number sequence of all the podcasts. We got five, six going, and they're all going in the same order. I really thought by now I would have at least messed up the order or repeated the same number, but no, it's all been smooth. Every single podcast, sequentially in order, I've gotten right for two and a half years. You sure you don't have like a little checklist or something where you're marking it off? Well, the, the, the good thing is I archive it on YouTube, so it keeps me going. But sometimes I'm wondering, like, because some of the hosts will send me the, their numbers wrong. They'll be like, oh, this is episode 20 when it's actually 21. And I'm like, okay. And so is, is that like me where I had, I used to have two numbers on top of our yes, rundown. It yes. was like, this was like show something and it was six numbers off for some reason. So it's like a, a nice little test for me. But <laughs> okay, real quickly before we get to jock jams. So I wake up this morning in a panic and I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, is this real or not? So I'm a nervous fan. So in key games for Michigan State, only really with Michigan State because I love them so much. I get really excited being a supporter, being a graduate of Michigan State. I had a dream, and this is not even realistic, so I knew it was a dream when I woke up. I had a dream that I did not watch the championship game. Michigan State was playing P, capital P, capital E, capital A, capital Y, and I had taped the game. So in the dream sequence, I'm not watching the game. I'm watching something else. I'm doing something else. All of a sudden, a family member switched to the game at the, the, the final crunch time moments, and Michigan State turns the ball over, and they lose to P. 67, 67 to 64, and all of a sudden the ball rolls away. Denzel Valentine's in the middle of the court crying, and I'm like, no, no, this is horrible. I can't believe this happened. I'm going to be made fun of for Michigan State losing to P. And I'm like, oh, it was just that moment. It was so vivid, too. Like, uh, they had the ball, and it was like they had a chance, and I don't know if someone swatted the ball away. The ball's rolling to the other side. Denzel puts his head up, and all of a sudden just starts crying, getting all upset. The, the crowd's rushing, and I'm just, like, all devastated because I wanted to tune in later. And uh, I think this plays into the fact I didn't watch Game 7 of the Red Wings versus Pittsburgh when they lost. I uh, went out on a date with my wife, and I saw, uh, we went for a little walk, and I saw Pittsburgh holding the Stanley Cup in someone's window. And I'm like, oh, this is after my wife thought that, you know, she's like, oh, I think the Wings scored first. I heard a loud cheer. And I'm like, oh, okay, good, good. I didn't watch, um, I didn't watch the game live, but I had a dream that Michigan State lost to P, and I was devastated, and I was very mad And when I woke up this morning. <laughs> 
<laughs> insane. Insane. Absolutely insane. They lost to P, hey? They, they lost to P. And I think, I don't know if I was hurt more of the fact that I knew I was going to be ridiculed, like, oh, here we go. State lost to P. <laughs> and I thought for a second, wait a minute, is this, you know, when you wake up and you're not like, is this, is this real or not? But you can tell I'm really <laughs> invested in this tournament. I really want them to go strong. And I'm like, yeah, vivid. I was like, P-E-A-Y. And I think it's because I've heard a lot like Florida, Southern, to Midwest, Tennessee, just all kinds of random I schools have, that you have no yeah, idea where they're located. I have, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm like, I've never heard of P-E-A-Y. They want it all. And uh, so that was my whacked out Dude. dream. Luckily, it was a dream. Michigan State hasn't even started yet. You wake up in a cold sweat, like where you got to go change your T-shirt. <laughs> I was just mad and frustrated. <laughs> and I was really living it because I've lived it before. You know, that loss to North Carolina, I think now I'm just starting to like have you know, flashbacks. That was I was invested in that game, man. I had the, the the flashing light, you know, little necklace with Michigan State, green and white. They had the run. It would have been a dream scenario winning it in Ford Field in front of everybody. I was having that and um unfortunately I uh we did not come to fruition. Losing in the title game and uh you know Michigan State losing this year in the college football playoff. I think some of it's coming out now that I've I've that I've held in and uh been strong and brave, but now it showed up in my dream. Will you feel better once they get that first win over Middle Tennessee out of the way? Yeah, exactly. You know, I was and also too you, you don't want to be defeatist, but I didn't want Michigan State also to be number one, first team to lose to a 16, just in case it were to happen. So 215 is one of those upsets that has happened quite a bit. I think, is that the one that you got to pick in your bracket, the 215? Is the one that happens the most, or is it the, the, the 7 or the, the 5 The 512. 512 happens all the time. Exactly. And if you look at the 512 matchups this year, every single 12 can beat the 5. In that sense, whew, thank goodness I survived my dream. Michigan State's still in the tournament, and there is no such team as P. P E A Y. <laughs> uh, all right, let's get to it. Did they have green jerseys as well? It was white. Stay, uh, de- well, I think. Uh, I think uh, no. The P jersey was just white. Just so, white. Okay. White, white, <laughs> white P. <laughs> I, think, I think you had peas last night for dinner. That's what the problem was. <laughs> this is a segment we call Jack Jams. I got three great questions lined up for the Jack, and he's going to be ready to deliver strong sports takes in what we call Jack Jams. All right, we're moving right along. NFL free agency. We're starting to see kind of what Bob Quinn is looking to do in terms of his free agent additions. One of the ones you could question was paying so much money to a special teams a free agent, special team specialist. I understand that he wants to go out there and find guys that he that he thinks can help this team, maybe from a New England organization as well. But I'm very fascinated to get your opinions on the moves that Bob Quinn has made thus far. How do you think he's been in terms of allocating the funds and who he's targeted? Going into this offseason, he had a ton of cap space. And I think he's done a great job spreading that money around. If you look at what he's done, he's basically brought in guys to help fill out this roster. They were really shorthanded. He's helped bolster some of the depth on this team. On top of all of that, if you look at the contracts that were signed, they are two, maybe three-year contracts. They're very salary-friendly. So what he's doing in, in what it looks like he's doing is he is building temporarily to help bridge that gap so he can get a couple draft classes in here to sit there and help fill out the ranks of this team, which I think works out great. So it looks like he came in here, he had a plan, and now what he's doing is he is following his plan and addressing the needs of this team. The next big move that has to be made is whether or not Russell Okun comes in and and slots in as left tackle. If they can get Russell Okun, which will be a, a huge grab, you now have upgraded your left tackle spot as well as your right tackle, because now you can move Riley Reef over to right tackle, and you basically kill two birds with one stone. But everything Bob Quinn has done thus far this offseason, thoroughly impressed. Thoroughly impressed. I think it's been great. And I like the fact that he is getting these players in here on very short-term contracts. So he can turn around in two, three years, blow them out of the door, and he's got guys that he's drafted coming up the ranks. And that's what I think bodes well for this team, because we talk about it all the time. How do you win championships in the NFL? You win them through the draft. You build through your trenches, and that's how you sit there and you put out quality teams. When you go into free agency, you grab a piece, maybe two pieces, even if you have to overspend a little bit, but that piece right there is kind of the crowning achievement. It's like the cherry on the sundae. You just place it on top. You're not sitting there filling your ice cream cup up with those cherries. That's what the Lions used to do. They used to sit there and load up their ice cream cups with cherries because they'd go out in free agency, overspend, spending what sixty, seventy thousand dollars on 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 cherries there when you have no ice cream in your damn cup. So I think it's been great. I think the things Bob Quinn has done has been exceptional. You said cherries. <laughs> I I don't know, man. I needed to make a metaphor there. I was stretching. 
now we got to talk a little bit about some of the disappointments in Detroit sports. Teams that have we, that we've counted on to kind of step up now in crunch time, and it's been disappointing with what we've seen in this last week. With 14 games left, what has disappointed you about this Detroit Pistons team, especially after that Washington game? A game that, okay, we understand wins and losses. We all understand that. But when you go out there uh, versus a team that had that losing streak, five games coming in, lost in a row, and you put up that performance, SVG had another 30-second quit, boom, we got our ass kicked. Very disappointing, and it's just one of those situations where it's not something you would expect at this point in the season. Where is the competitive fire? Where is your desire to compete? Where is your desire to actually turn this franchise around and stop giving us the same story year in, year out? What's disappointing you about this Pistons team? The inability to show up and play every single game. Now, there's a difference between showing up and and just basically throwing your jersey on and competing. They don't compete most nights. Uh, if you go back and you look at their 30, 33 losses that they have right now, they don't compete. They haven't competed. You know, you, you look at the game against the Wizards, you get blown out of the gym by 43 points. That That's like you're trying to lose. That's been my biggest issue with this team is on certain nights, they don't even bother to show up. They look so disjointed and they look like they have no idea what's even going on. And I don't get it because they've got all the talent in the world. We've discussed this numerous times. They have all the talent in the world. They've got enough talent to go on a run and make it very difficult inside these NBA playoffs that are coming up right now. They don't need anything else. They've got talent. They've got pieces. They just don't ever put it together all the time. And that's the problem. And what's most concerning is when you say, yeah, they're young. Yeah, they're young. Okay, when are they going to turn the corner now? A lot of these guys have been in the league a, a little bit longer term. Now, yes, Stanley Johnson's off the hook. He's a rookie. But I know this is a new blend, a new mix with SVG. But at this point in time, you would think that they wouldn't get blown out in a game. You wouldn't think they'd show up and not even put forth the effort. Dude, the game was like 16-2 to two the other night before you even blinked. And, and they never got back into it. It, it was atrocious atrocious embarrassing and svg i know you appreciate his candor but at this point in time i'd rather him say you know what i gotta go and dig in the trenches figure out why the hell this is happening are you not giving them the rah-rah message that you need to is the pregame meal tainted or what's going on where you show up on the road you think maybe he prime time embarrassing you think maybe he sends a message to a starters benches all of them and starts the second string some message needs to be sent because you can't have a performance like that at this point in the season but it's it's unacceptable it's It's unacceptable best way to put it all right switching gears talking about the tigers lots of good news and notes with the detroit tigers in spring training they're mashing the ball left and right they they're eating their wheaties left and right i mean you had mccann with the grand slam the other day verlander looks good verlander looks good um, relatively speaking, they're going through to the start of the season with guys that do have question marks with injuries. But the biggest one, the biggest injury that occurred was Victor Martinez. And uh, he left the game uh, earlier this week with a mild hamstring strain. He was slated to start first base this weekend. But according to Brad Ausmus and what he's revealed, it's likely with no setbacks, he might be the, uh, the first baseman, he might be the DH this upcoming weekend. If there are no setbacks, you concerned maybe going forward that the older veterans, a la Miguel Cabrera, Victor Martinez, the guys that we're counting on to do some damage might be injury prone. You concerned about Victor Martinez? Oh, Victor Martinez is hurt again? Yeah. Again? Yes, I'm concerned. Victor Martinez and and Anibal Sanchez seem like they're held together with bubble gum and, and shreds of duct tape, man. We're nervous. So, and those are two pieces that we highlighted earlier in this year that have to perform for this team to, to sit there and be a World Series contender. So absolutely I'm concerned that Victor Martinez is injured again. And this, he was just trying to leg out a double. He rounded first base. He said it felt a little bit tight, so he decided to ease up and pull up. And he went back to first base, and basically a double became a single. And he got, he got pulled from the game. And precautionary measures, they checked it out. They say it's not that big of a deal, like you said. He should possibly be back by this weekend. But... This just kind of points more to where Victor Martinez is in his career. And he is an essential cog in this Tigers lineup. You need him every single day to show up and play. And this guy doesn't have the body that can withstand the rigors of a 162-game season. And he can't even get through spring training. Last season, he got hurt during spring training. He was sitting there doing some some warm-up drills where he was trying to stretch out his legs and blew out his knee again. This time, it's his hamstring. 
Honestly, I feel like his ligaments and his cartilage is basically sawdust. This is very concerning. Annabelle Sanchez is another concern for me. Thank God Miggy's not hurt right now. My hope is that he can make it through the rigors of the season, possibly sitting him time in and time out, um, depending on what Osmus is feeling with him and, and kind of where Miguel's body is telling him to go. But, yeah, I think going into this season, you have to be concerned about these players. You know, a guy like Annabelle Sanchez, he is slotted in as your number three starter. He is a guy who you are leaning on at the top of that pitching rotation. Victor Martinez is a guy who you are leaning on to bat cleanup in that, in that batting order. And you need these guys to perform. And they keep seeming to be hurt all the time when you turn around. So huge concerns here. I'm happy that it doesn't seem like it's a major injury. But this will be something, if it's a hamstring injury, these can linger. This can linger all the way up in through middle of June, July. You know, it's one of those things where he's just got to stretch it out a little bit more. But again, he could be legging out a, a, a double and get halfway to second. Next thing you know, he's down for six to eight weeks. It's one of those types of injuries where it, it can come on and you're down for a while. So yes, I'm concerned. Yeah, I think we all are because at any moment, any swing of the bat, any time he's going to be running the bases, is it going to be his last play of the season? And because those hamstrings are not just easy injuries to come back from. I've dealt with uh, calf strains, hamstring uh, problems in the past playing soccer and tennis, and I'm like, man, you think it's good. You, you, you stretch, you practice, you get out there, you do your thing, and all of a sudden you feel something. You're like, seriously? And especially at 37 years old, I'm talking about when I was like, you know, 21, 22, they would, you know, still linger, but it wouldn't be as bad. Imagine if you're, you know, my age. Oh my gosh, if I had a, if I had a hamstring injury, I might have to call off the podcast. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm okay. wheeling in with a wheelchair and a nurse. <laughs> right, exactly. See, at, you know, 37, man, you know what that means? I just now thought about it with my recent birthday. I'm Victor Martinez's age. You are. Hey, now, what are you going to do? Damn I'm near, yeah. damn near 100. Damn near 100. V-Mart. They need to definitely. You move much faster than Vmart, believe it or not. Yeah, I probably do, and that's what I'm saying. And uh, I just wish that you know this could be really one of the, if you really look at it in totality, one of the most disappointing sporting years in Detroit sports in a long time. You know, you have the Pistons, Wings, Tigers all struggling. The Lions in transition. You, you really got to turn to college basketball for some enjoyment around here. Yeah, let's look at this. All right. So you've got the Wings, who have the possibility to miss the playoffs for the first time in 20 some years. Gripping. All right. You've got the the Pistons who at certain points this season look like world beaters. Can handle they, success. They, they have beaten the very best teams in the NBA, yet there's a good possibility right now they're on the outside of the playoffs looking in. You've got your Tigers, who basically it's World Series are bust, and you've got players like Anibal Sanchez, Victor Martinez, who can't stay healthy, and that right there damages your, your lineup every single day. So maybe they miss the playoffs. You go to the Lions, I mean, it's the Lions. They've sucked for the last 50-some years, right? It's the Lions. So it's the Lions, whatever. This is bad. Exactly, not making the playoffs. And then you turn your hopes to maybe Michigan hoops if you're a Blue fan, and good oh. God, somehow they got into the into the tourney. I do think they'll get hot and they'll make a little bit of a run, but they're not going anywhere. They're not winning any championships. So now all your hopes has to rest on Michigan go green, State. go white. Imagine That's that, it. listening audience. Everything. Everything you need for some enjoyment in the sports world of a Detroit sports fan rests with green and white. Maybe they can do it. Maybe they can bring home a title and they can wash away all the stink that's been happening with the other organizations. It's very interesting. They're all kind of in transition, in flux. It's an interesting scenario, kind of, if you literally think about it. All four professional organizations are in that uh you know, I think, remember two years ago, we did that state of the Detroit sports type yep. thing. I think that's going to be coming around again soon because if you really think about it, all four teams kind of starting anew and they're kind of starting on a new path with younger athletes and staying with us uh, after the break. We're going to talk about one of those new young athletes that made his debut for the Red Wings in Anthony Mantha. But these teams looking at it right now, they're don't, they don't really look to be on the verge of championship success. We're looking at really, when you really kind of look at it now, Four teams that are rebuilding, now trying to get to the point where they get to the playoffs and have consistent success. Now, the Tigers, you could say, are, are closer than the rest, but... But their window is shutting. Their window is getting closer. Closing. And you're right. All, right now, we've gone from having they missed champion, the playoffs. Have championship contenders to hopefully... Wannabes. Wannabes. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully playoff contenders. Hopefully playoff contenders. Like, everybody's on the outside looking in. They're and, and, and hoping that they can make the playoffs. Yeah, and uh, yeah, new general total, managers. Total change. Yeah, it's actually happened right before our eyes. New general managers, new coaches. Very interesting stuff going around in Detroit sports. And when you put it that way, 
all you listening uh, out there are resting your hopes on Michigan State. Mm, very interesting times we're living in. And now, though, too, the other beacon of hope is Jim Harbaugh in Michigan. He's kind of shined a very bright light in this region, and I think it's actually kind of masking some of the, uh, you know, some of the other problems that are going on because a lot of people who are Michigan fans are really, really happy at this point in time. Not going to lie. All right, stay with us. After the break, we're going to talk about the Red Wings. Go in depth and look at what the hell has been going on. Another abysmal performance versus Philadelphia. They do tend to struggle on the road there, but the level of play, what they did in front of the Detroit fans on television and at the arena there in Philadelphia, very disappointing. We'll break it all down next. Detroit Sports Podcast, Doc and Jock, episode 136. I want to tell everyone out there about DetroitSportsNation.com. They're a great website, and they've been very supportive to all the shows on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. They host all the podcasts. They have great writers that cover all the Detroit teams, all the college teams. Check out their website and support those who support us. DetroitSportsNation.com. The collaboration has been excellent, and it's helped us to continue to grow and have great guests take phone calls. So our collaboration with the Detroit Sports Nation has really been successful, and support those who support us. DetroitSportsNation.com The mics are hot. Office lights are still on. I want to just thank everybody again for your continued support, visiting our sponsors by visiting our website, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. I'm very happy that we do have a great uh, engagement with the listener challenge. I'm hoping I don't fall and rank in the lower half of that challenge. I'm just hoping to be in the top half, but I'm very excited. We got a nice little healthy number of contestants there. I'm hoping to do well again in the bracket challenge among the hosts. So it's a very fun time here at the network. I'm enjoying it, enjoying the conversations, just enjoying firing up the microphones and breaking things down. And man, an hour and a half kind of goes by fast doing these podcasts, but I thoroughly enjoy doing it. But one of the reasons I also enjoy doing the podcast is a chance to vent. I mean, literally Monday, Tuesday, back to back, you had probably two of the worst performances, not only in the recent memory, but of almost all time. People have said, have you really seen a worse Piston game where you get blown up by 40 more points? Have you ever seen a scenario where the Red Wings show up in the first period in an important game needing points and they get outshot by that margin? Devastating loss versus Philadelphia, especially the circumstances. You are three points ahead. They got, Philadelphia has two, point, two games in hand. So you're riding that, uh, the, riding the fence of being out of the playoffs. You have that eighth spot. You have a situation where you have a debuting young kid that is, you know, all the talk in the minors, all the talk in the organization, that this is a guy that we had to keep. We couldn't trade off to get pieces. Anthony Mantha shows up in his debut. You know, you'd think that the Red Wings would have more fire. They came out, and they looked okay in the first five minutes, but then the first goal was so horrible. Mrazic goes down too soon. It looked like a, you know, a very big goaltending mistake. Gives up a goal. Then the next goal is a rebound. Boom, bang, bang. Within the first, you know, 12 minutes, you're down 2-0 and you got outshot that terribly, it was just a terrible performance in, in that game. I going, was pissed. Going into the second period, it was an 11-1 to 1 ratio, 11.5-1 to 1 shot differential ratio. What's going That's on? That's unbelievable. The Detroit Red Wings couldn't get the puck out of their own zone. And sticking in that first period and talking about Anthony Mantha, I was not impressed. I was not. No he, points he, in he, debut. He, he seemed like he was a ghost. He looked like he was getting pushed around. He looked uncomfortable for that first period. That being said, second period rolled around, third period rolled around. He looked like he got a little bit more comfortable. He started making some plays. Looked like he didn't look as strong as I was hoping for because you have to remember, the big thing about Anthony Mantha is he's a big guy, he's got talent, he can score, and he can skate. I was watching that game, and he was just getting pushed around like he was a rag doll. So he got a little bit more comfortable come the second period. He helped. He didn't get any points. And he wasn't a plus or a minus, but he did he did contribute on one of Pavel Datsuk's goals. He had a real nice play along the boards where he chipped the puck back in. Thomas Tatar went, retrieved it, and passed it out to Pavs. Pav scored. So if he was at home, possibly could have got a got got a, got an apple there, got a little assist, but he did not. It, it's going to be interesting because that was his first real taste of the big leagues, and I think that first period kind of shocked him a little bit because they're moving much faster, they're much stronger. It's a much harder hitting game because he was out there getting crunched on a couple plays. And Wayne Simmons can be a nasty character and was in his face chirping pretty much the entire first period. Ended up standing up for himself. Uh, I think he got a little bit more comfortable come the second and third period, and he looked okay. It'll be real interesting if they keep him up and he gets to play another game 
because I think it'll be a little bit different for him. I think he'll be in the game a little bit more offensively. I think he'll be a little bit more physical, and I don't think he'll get pushed around, and I don't think there'll be this overwhelming look of, hey, maybe this league is too much for me, because like I said, by the time the third period rolled around, I think he fit in nicely. He slotted in just fine, and he performed, but I was woefully disappointed the way he came out of the gate. Now, we talked about it. Um, The month of March is going to be brutal. There are, I believe, 12 games left, and if the Red Wings just go 8-4, and four, they'll finish with 96 points, which is still short of the 100-point mark last year with Mike Babcock. So that's going to be a tough feat to get eight wins in the next 12 games. So this team right now, when you look at it, is no guaranteed lock to make the postseason. They're dealing with a significant injury and Nicholas Cronwall being out, and he's been in and out of the lineup all year. The defense has been just as much to blame as the offense. They're not able to, you know, brush aside people in front of the net. They're giving up juicy rebounds, and the guys are right there to put the puck right back in the net. You know, the first goal you could say was on Mrazek, but he had an okay night, nothing too stellar. With the Red Wings, the concern is, okay, going forward, this is a team that doesn't look like they're firing on all cylinders. It looks like a team that I'm watching that's underachieving. And I believe that goes right to head coach Blaschel and the fingers pointed right back at him. This is a young group of talent that you got here. This is a group of talent that you've seasoned. You've seen them in the minors. You've coached them up. Now they get to the big time and it's time to perform and they're performing like that. I'm not really sure I'm been, um, I'm not really sure I'm satisfied with what I'm seeing from all fronts, the offense, the defense. I don't think that the Red Wings are dictating play in their style of play. It looks like they're more reactionary. It looks like a lot of the play is in our own zone. I'm not satisfied with anything that I'm really seeing outside of maybe the goaltending and the up-and-down performance of the young superstars. This is a team that is young, yes, but at this point in time, they've had playoff series. They've been around the block. This is nothing new to them. And I understand last year that they barely got in with 100 points, but that team looks a lot better than this team. I agree with you. It, the, the, the big issue, I don't even think it's so much that it's Blaschel's fault. I think it's just where these players are at in their career. I mean, you've got to look. Hank and Pav, they're older, and yet they're still being leaned on to be the major contributors offensively. But they're nowhere near with it, the old th- themselves. Exactly. And then you've got this young talent. You said it yourself. They're up and down. I mean, Dylan Larkin came on white hot. He's petered out. He's cooled down. You know, you, you brought in Anthony Mantha hoping to sit there and, and spark a boost. And like I said, his first period, he looked out of place. Calmed down, come the second and third, looked a little bit better, but still didn't really put any points on the board. You know, you've got a lot of other, you got you got younger talent that is slightly older than those guys in a Thomas Tatar and a Gustav Nyquist, and they're all over the place. I mean, they're about as bipolar as some of the patients that come into your office. It, it, it's unbelievable. So now take into account that you lose your number one defenseman in Nicholas Cronwall, Whew, who hasn't had a very good year all season long. He looks a, a step slow. He looks like he's sometimes playing behind the eight ball. So now you've got to lean on other guys like a Kyle Quincy, who seems to make bonehead plays, a Brendan Smith, who makes bonehead plays, a Marchenkov, who's a young guy. You know, you, you've got basically a patchwork for this team, and it just doesn't seem like it's gelling, and it should be gelling at the right time, which is right now, and it's not. And when you look at the what's going to happen in April, you're going to play Minnesota, Toronto, then the last week, could be make or break, and look at this murderous role you're going to play. Uh, Wednesday the 6th, Philadelphia at home. The 7th, the next night, on the road versus Boston. And then you finish out the regular season on the road versus the Rangers. Yep. That If you're going to, imagine that, cuz. You're going to need maybe, you know, you're going to need probably eight wins. You're going to need about 16 to 18 more points to maybe feel comfortable going into the postseason. Where are you going to get the points? Uh, Philadelphia, Boston, the Rangers, the last week of the season. I'm almost to the point where I can almost say, I don't think they're making the playoffs. You can you can look at the, even the next two weeks. You got to go up against the likes of Florida. You got to go up against Tampa Bay. You got to go up against Pittsburgh. You know, you better get healthy against teams like Montreal, uh, Buffalo, and, and you better hope for a win against Columbus and Toronto going down the stretch here. Because, like you said, you need to get these points. Otherwise, you're not making it to the playoffs. Do you see a switch that could be flipped? I mean... Uh, the style of play doesn't look right. I mean, you're getting the, the play is mostly in our zone. We're not fluid through the neutral zone. We're not sustaining pressure. The power play is horrible. I mean, you bring in a guy like Mike Green, 
And this is a guy that we're all clapping like, yes, we got Mike Green. This is a guy we wanted last year. And he comes in and he looks like another one of the guys that Holland brings in that doesn't fit in here. I mean, this is a guy you wanted maybe to quarterback your power play, but he doesn't seem like he fits that role. He just kind of seems like a guy that likes to peek in on the rush every now and then, solid defensively. But I can say it. I I guess I overreacted to Mike Green. He sucked this year. He's not been what you wanted. You know what? I think a lot of the issues with this team lie squarely at the feet of Ken Holland. Ken Holland, at the trade deadline, went out, did nothing, basically traded uh, your seventh defenseman, who you could be using right now because Nicholas Cronwell's hurt, for a bag of laundry so you get $2 million in cap space. Um, you look at what he's brought in during the free agency period, headed into this year, brought in Mike Green. That was a guy we wanted two years ago, and he's not really worked out the way you wanted it. If you go back and you look over the, his last couple trades at the trade deadline, none of those guys really worked out either. You know, it, it's been a lot of swings and misses for Kenny, and I have no idea what he's doing at this point. Honestly, I have no clue. I never saw you. There's I never saw you that it's going to be a disastrous season. I, I think I think it's a very real possibility they missed the playoffs this year. I, I, I think it's very real. If right now, if I have to put it at a percentage, looking at this upcoming schedule that they have, and then taking into account how close Philadelphia is on their heels, I think it's probably about a 74% chance that they missed the playoffs. Ooh. The way that they are playing right now, the way they looked last night, and the way that they have looked the last couple games, you've got to realize they go into these games and they fall behind early and often. I mean, you go back Chicago early, Chicago early, Columbus falling behind early again. Winnipeg, you fall behind early, yet you somehow come out with a win. The Rangers, you were getting completely outskated, and yet somehow you were able to muster a win in that game. You lose to Toronto. You lose to Philly, and you totally got your butts handed to you that first period. I mean, you were totally hot shot most of that game. Honestly, the way they keep entering into these games and the way that they keep playing, I have very big concerns that they miss the playoffs, and I think it's somewhere near 74% that, that they don't get in. I mean, Philadelphia is going to have to basically crumble down the stretch here, and the Wings are going to have to somehow muster up some wins. And you said it yourself, man. That's a tough schedule coming down the rope here. Uh, you got you got Florida, you got Tampa, um, you've got Pittsburgh, who's getting hot right now. Um, you've got a Minnesota team that's fighting for for playoff lives. You've got Philadelphia, who they can't seem to get a win against this year. Boston and the Rangers. It just, I just don't see it happening right now, man. I really don't. Quickly, your thoughts. They don't make the playoffs. Fire Blaschel. No. Oh. It's first year, man. You got to give this guy some time. He's the one who's coached a lot of this young talent. He knows the buttons to push with them. On top of that, who do you want? Who's out there that you want? Is there a guy out there that that's screaming, I want this guy here as, as the coach? No, but uh, I think the part that we'll look at is that did the Wings make the right decision in going out and getting a guy from the minors, plucking him into uh, this situation with these young guys instead of maybe getting in a, a, a more established uh, head coach? Because I think what a lot of people are like thinking Dan is Bilesma? someone, yeah, someone that you you could you know maybe take this talent and take it to the next level. I think that what a lot of people are thinking is with someone different, maybe they could be producing a little bit more. Sometimes you have to admit that you can only go so far with a certain group of guys, and maybe this is the ceiling for them with Blashill. But I understand they'll be patient with them, and they they might not be as devastatingly disappointed if they don't make the playoffs, but it'll be a big blow to that organization. It will. You know what I think a huge issue, too, with this team was? You had a lot of young talent that you were trying to fit in through the course of the year. Instead of sitting there taking your lumps early on in the season, like those first two months, playing the young guys a lot and kind of seeing what you have, hoping that talent develops and, and matures and then gels into something, you were trying to do it on the fly through the course of the entire season. So their playing time kind of got hindered and they didn't get to get out there as much and work with each other as much as you would have liked. So instead of taping, taking your lumps early, you're now taking them in the middle in, in the later half of the season. And right now is the time when you're supposed to be gelling and you're supposed to be rocking and rolling. And you're not. And hope we, we can you know, have a little hope that maybe they turn it around. Maybe they get desperate in these last 12 games and they turn it on. But, oof. Been dev devastatingly disappointing what we've seen the last couple weeks. It's not these good, Not good. Very sad. Very sad. And uh, especially for a team like this because the talent is there. We see it. And maybe we got to start talking about is the talent the issue as well, as well as the management above Jeff Blaschel. But th things will we'll peak in the next week. A very big week for the Red Wings upcoming. All right. Let's close this podcast out. Finally, you've presented a mock draft from somebody with half a brain and somebody <laughs> that looks like they know what they're doing and knows what they're presenting. 
and uh, each of the last couple weeks, each of the last three or four weeks, we've looked at mock drafts from all over, from CBS, from NFL.com. And this week, you chose Daniel Jeremiah, NFL.com. He has a very solid first-round board, and I was very impressed. I'm kind of, you know, the first thing that's eye-opening is how high up Ezekiel Elliott is, gonna, is looking right now. Yeah, I see a, that too. A, a lot of people, and Vinny brought it up on the Motor City Sports Rant podcast, he said that he won't fall to the to the Lions. He'll be up there with the Eagles. And I was like, really? And this mock draft has him firmly planted going eighth. So I was a little pleasantly surprised at that. Uh, I do like the, the way he's slotting this based on the needs. A lot of people are talking about Conklin going to the Raiders. I've been intently focused on where he might go, where he might be impacting, and uh, his performance at the Combine has kind of taken him from that lower tier, kind of in some mock drafts, and put him into that maybe top 15 spot. So... Looks like Conklin might not be there. And so if you were to take an offensive lineman, it might be Taylor Decker. This gentleman's mock draft, he has Kevin Dodd, defensive end, Clemson. And I understand the selection, and I understand his reasoning in that he doesn't think the Lions will go for a D tackle. He believes that, you know what, there's a lot of depth in terms of defensive tackle that the Lions could actually wait a little bit and choose those in later rounds. So I agree. Kevin Dodd, 6'5", 277-pound defensive end from Clemson. I like the selection. I think this is a player, when you watch him on film, when you look at his total package, could come in under the tutelage of Terrell Austin and come in and contribute right away. So that's all I ask in the draft is just pick a player that's going to be a good character guy. Now, you know, doesn't have to be a choir guy, doesn't have to be totally, you know, balls to the wall and, you know, full-on bipolar, but somebody that's going to come in on defense and wreak havoc uh, break up plays, and cause disruption to the quarterbacks. If that's the guy they get, I'd be very satisfied. Yeah, he's a guy who you could slot in right away, get some production from. Also, there is another layer to him, almost like an onion. You peel it back. You can help develop some some more hand uh, movements, some some different ways to get around some tackles. So he has a little bit of development that needs to be done, but he's a guy who you could put in right away, get some production from. He's uh, comparable to a Michael Bennett, you know, for the Seattle, Seah- Seattle Seahawks. It's a very that's a guy who I think all of us would love on this uh, Detroit Lions front line. I'm not I'm not upset with the pick at all. But um, now there is a little fear though that I did develop. And anytime we do and explore NFL mock drafts, mm-hmm. we start looking. Okay, what's going on between pick 17 through 31 or 32? And I go, okay, who's the Hall of Fame player that's gonna the Lions are gonna pass on if they take Reed? And I look and I go, uh oh. 6'3", 307 pounder Jerron Reed, defensive tackle, slotted to go 21 to, uh, to Washington. And I'm like, this guy I saw. I saw what he was able to do because I obviously am a diehard, uh, you know, crazy Michigan State guy. And I saw what Alabama was able to do versus Michigan State. So this is a guy that hasn't been talked about too much as a selection for the Lions, but I looked at his overall performances, and this is a guy that could also be a very talented NFL guy and a guy that I go, Uh uh-oh, if he slots down lower in the first round of the NFL draft, I could be a little bit nervous that he could come back and bite us in the butt. And that's what I hate about looking at drafts. I always go, who are the one or two guys that are going to go after? And uh, this is one of them. Yeah, He he had a good season. Dron Dron Reed's explosive. He's very powerful. He would be a great pass rush as well as uh, a run stuffer. More of a run stuffer than a pass rusher, but the dude's a monster. On top of that, the guy who goes two picks after... Kevin Dodd, Reggie Ragland, that's a guy who could help out at linebacker, can also play uh, a little bit D-end if you get a little bit creative with him, put him on the edge there and let him go rush. So those are two guys that, you're right, let's play the game, let's see who the Lions miss on when they sit there and they take a swing on Kevin Dodd. And those are the two names that stand out to me and you both. And here's the deal. If they take Kevin Dodd, Reggie Ragland, or Jerron Reed, I think we'll all be ecstatic because they're helping fill some holes on the defense and now these guys just have to pan out. I really like Reggie Raglan, inside linebacker. You like Jerron Reed, who was a monster up front for Alabama. As well as a Sean Robinson. Exactly. You know, you got two guys on that defensive uh, on that defensive line for Alabama, and that's why they were ranked number one. Yeah, A. Sean Robinson goes 24th in this mock draft as well. That's a guy who I really like, dude. That guy, he's an interesting character. Just, like, looking at him, he looks like he works at your dad's, like, car shop, like, Sitting there, seeing him wearing some blue overalls and and, and smoking a, a cig while he's sitting there wrenching on your car, you know he just <laughs> yeah. he's he's just he, that's what he looks like, man. He looks like he's one of those dudes who you don't want to mess with. You don't want to meet him in a dark alley. So yeah, I would I would love Ashawn Robinson. Oh, I would love. 
I guess uh, my I guess my first limited goal would be just in this this draft, the first one. Let's not look in three years and go, okay, the guy that they didn't select. Because I think the impact of not drafting Donald, of not drafting Odell Beckham, you know, when you draft Eric Ebron, it's so glaring. It is way too traumatic, and I think it's affecting me personally. I think I am uh, I'm very gun-shy looking at these mock drafts. I'm very much going, oh, my God, I can't. I cannot sit here and say I'm happy with who they're going to pick because no, no, I feel like look, I feel like who I feel like the poor guy that gets drafted his career's over. Look, look, <laughs> look, 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 look at it like this, right? You could you, you could pass, if you wanted to go offense in that draft where you took Eric Ebum, you could have picked Odell Beckham Jr. There would be no talk about getting a wide receiver because you would already have your Calvin Johnson replacement. It, it would it just the way this team has done things in the past blows your mind, and I know that you're apprehensive even with Bob Quinn coming in. Doing things much different. The in, negativity is seeping back it, into the, yes. to the room. It, it just, it's what happens. It's because you're like an abused wife, man. Yeah. You keep falling down. You keep hitting your face on that table. Ugh. But he loves you. Don't worry. He loves you. And so does that table that you keep falling into. It loves you too. When's the draft now? How many more, roughly more days? Was it April something or other? Uh, April 21st, 22nd? I think so. so I, I don't know off the top 40 of 40 days or so. Let's oh, see. Boy. Let's see if I can find out for you here. Yeah, so... That's that's what I'm saying is that it's hard to peek into these mock drafts and just really be confident because whew, stop falling into the table. That's all you got to do. That's it. Just be just be uh, objective, as they say. Stop take the emotion out of it, Doc. Is what I got to do. It's just super hard to do because you really want the guy to come in and really be successful. So what are you gonna do? We're getting closer to that draft, though. We are. Let's see here. Uh, it's going to be April 28th through the 30th. 28th. Okay, a little bit yeah. more time. Okay, we got a little more time. I'm really much enjoying these mock drafts, and uh, this is the first one I'm very satisfied with and uh, is a very good good selection. But it, this one uh, raises my anxiety more than the others. The first two that you, you had raised my anger because they had offensive players. This one raises my anxiety. So you're doing a good job. Do, do you realize that the San Francisco 49ers have 12 picks in this draft? <laughs> they need all of them. Jesus, They basically Pete. need all of them to pan out. Oh, man. If you were the Lions, who, what could you do with 12 picks? That'd be awesome. Botch all 12. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just up the number in terms of how many botch picks you have. Oh, you know? man. In, in, in 2010 or so, you have, or 2010, 2011 or so, you have no picks left. You just go, okay, in 2016, they had 12 picks. And in 27, in 2019, none of them are left. <laughs> They've all left or all had success elsewhere. That's the Detroit Lions. That's what they're trying to correct. And uh, we'll see if they do it. Great podcast, sir. Very much so. That We're into spring. This is the fun next couple of days. You know, enjoy the, um, you know, enjoy your time watching these college basketball games. Let's hope for uh, relatively drama-free opening rounds for Michigan State. Let's get to that Sweet 16 and have no problems. That's right. Yes, sir. For the Jock, Adam Strozinski, I am the Doc, John Macaroon. This has been episode 136 of the longest-running weekly episodic Detroit sports podcast going strong since September 2013. Love it each and every week, every Thursday. Thank you for those who have been downloading. We greatly appreciate it. Go green, go white. Sorry, Detroit. <laughs> didn't quite work out. And I, all I can say is Detroit sports podcast scores. I hear voices in my head, they counsel me, they understand, they talk to me.